If it wasn't already politically controversial, the trade union Royal Commission is now politically white hot. Labor's demanding the Royal Commissioner, Dyson Hayden, be dumped for accepting an invitation to speak at a Liberal Party fundraiser. On Liberal Party letterhead, Dyson Hayden was billed as guest speaker for the sixth annual Garfield Barwick Address. Those invited were asked to send their $80 cheques to the Liberal Party of Australia, New South Wales Division. Still seething over the treatment of its leader at the Royal Commission, Labor burst straight into the Parliament to make the obvious political point. The invitation to the Liberal Party fundraiser states that cheques should be made payable to Liberal Party of Australia, New South Wales Division. The invitation also states all proceeds from this event will be applied to state election campaigning. Two, accordingly, the House declares by his own actions, Dyson Hayden has disqualified himself from conducting the Prime Minister's Royal Commission into trade unions. He is conflicted, he is biased, the Royal Commission is a farce. Dyson Hayden is in a position now where he cannot remain in that role. And the sham that we have said for so long this Royal Commission was has now been found out and exposed. To have somebody who the Prime Minister held up as allegedly being impartial, now to have a situation where he is promoting the Liberal Party, being the guest, the draw card for a Liberal Party fundraiser, is an absolute disgrace. Those opposite are afraid of this debate. Those opposite have got to shut this debate down. But the people know bias when they see it. And the Australian people will understand exactly what's going on. With a Royal Commission reeked in bias, a Royal Commission completely conflicted. When a procedural motion is being moved, the Speaker moving it should be given the call. I don't but I note that you've now given me the call and I move well, the member be no me. longer heard. And that is what happened as the government used its numbers in that session this morning. But it won't be the end of the matter. Justice Hayden called an adjournment at the Royal Commission, which was sitting today when the news broke. Uh, the Trade Union Royal Commission later issued a statement saying Dyson Hayden will not be delivering the Sir Garfield Barwick address. He told the organisers of that address if there was any possibility that the event could be described as a Liberal Party event, he'll be unable to give the address, at least while he's in the position of the Royal Commissioner. Well, there is every possibility the event could be described as a Liberal Party event because Labor's already doing it. Its employment spokesman, Brendan O'Connor, is here with us and we'll be asking him about that in a moment. But first, let's hear what the Attorney-General, George Brandis, has had to say about the event. Attorney-General, is it appropriate... Let me just begin with a statement, if I may. Uh, the Shadow Attorney-General, Mr Dreyfus, has earlier in the day called into question the integrity and the professionalism of Mr Dyson Hayden. That personal attack on Mr Hayden by Mr Dreyfus is disgraceful. Mr Dreyfus, as a senior practising barrister, well knows that there are few more eminent lawyers in this country than Dyson Hayden. He has an absolutely stainless reputation for punctilious integrity. Mr Dreyfus's attack on this, on this gentleman, whom he knows to be a person of stainless activi uh, integrity, uh, reduces Mr Dreyfus. Is it uh, Attorney General, if, if the Royal Commissioner can't do his own due diligence, what faith can the public have in him to oversee other people's due well, diligence? Well, Mr Hayden um, was invited to deliver the Garfield Barwick oration. Uh, that is an oration delivered to the New South Wales Bar and Bench, advertised among the New South Wales Bar and Bench. And organised by the and, and if I may finish, and promoted by members of the New South Wales Bar who are members of the Liberal Party. It is a very common thing for eminent public figures to speak at political occasions. Uh, this is a, an occasion whose primary audience 
was the New South Wales Bar and the Bench. It was hosted by what I understand to be the legal practitioners branch of the New South Wales Liberal Party. But this is a public oration. Who would have received the funds? Um, I don't know. The Who Liberal would have received Party. The funds? I don't know. Who would have received the funds? I answered the question. You, I, you I, have attended I, this same event. Did you know that it was a Liberal Party I event? Ha I have given the Garfield Barwick oration myself, as have other former Attorneys General, including the Honourable Bob Ellicott and the Honourable Tom Hughes. Um, I know the event. The, you aware the, that the, was a the, party the, event, the, audi the audience of the event um, are largely barristers and judges. Did you know who made up the organisers of the event when uh, you addressed it? I think I did. But if there's nothing wrong with Dyson Hayden attending, then why has he stepped back? Well, well, from going? Uh, but just a moment. He's not attending. He was delivering the oration. This is not a political speech. It is an address on a legal topic. But it's was to it? raise money for a political organisation. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. I'm not a member of the New South Wales Division of the Liberal Party. But you just said but, you but were if, a but if, if I may finish, if I may finish, if eminent public figures are invited by political parties to give public lectures, I think that's a good thing. But AG, you said you knew that this was an event organised by the Liberal Party when you addressed it. Yes. Shouldn't the Royal Commissioner have also known? I'm completely certain that Mr Hayden, who, as I said before, is a person with an absolutely stainless reputation for punctilious integrity, would never have lent his name to uh, the support of one side or other of politics. This is, this is a man who has been a member of the High Court of Australia, before that of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, before that the leader of the New South Wales Bar. This is one of the most eminent Australians in the land, certainly one of the most eminent lawyers in the land, if he is invited to deliver a prestigious lecture, albeit one hosted by New South Wales barristers associated with the Liberal Party, I hardly think that constitutes taking sides. In hindsight, was it a mistake? Well, Mr Hayden has uh, withdrawn from the lecture and I think that should be the end of the matter. Isn't, doesn't that show it was a mistake? Uh, Mr Hayden has withdrawn from the lecture and that should be the Does end of the matter. Does this fully question any of the final results? So that was the attorney only moments ago here in the press gallery section of Parliament House and it is the cue to pick up with Labor's employment spokesman Brendan O'Connor. Brendan O'Connor, let's start with what uh, the attorney just said, that Dyson Hayden is a man of absolutely stainless reputation and stainless integrity. Is it possible he just wandered into an event without knowing uh, under whose auspices it was being held? No, it's not possible, Greg. Uh, these revelations today are clear-cut. Uh, the fact is that Mr Hayden uh, accepted an invitation to speak at a Liberal Party fundraising event. An event, I might add, is, uh, that's been running now for six years, the first speaker of which, of course, was the uh, current Attorney-General, and there were other Liberal Attorneys-General that were speakers uh, to this event. So it's widely known throughout the legal fraternity that this is a Liberal Party fundraiser and for that reason uh, the Commissioner, Mr Hayden, must disqualify himself uh, from the Royal Commission or the Prime Minister must intervene and stand him down. What of the argument that the government makes that this is just a law lecture? You're pointing out it's Liberal links but is it possible that, that anyone could have come along to uh, avail themselves of, of his words on whatever legal topic he was speaking. For some time now, the Liberal Party, and in particular the New South Wales Division, has been seeking donations uh, to this event, uh, and of course their star attraction uh, was Mr Hayden. Uh, what we need to know now, Greg, is how much money has the Liberal Party already raised on the back of the advertising of, the, uh, of this event and the fact that uh, Mr Hayden was going to be the guest speaker. We need to know how much money they've already raised and what they will do with that money. But in so far as Mr Hayden's concerned, the Prime Minister must act immediately. This is a captain's pick, another captain's pick, uh, where the Prime Minister has chosen this person to run a political witch hunt into the opponents of the government. We've, we've been saying all along it's been acting in a prejudicial and biased manner and now we have, um, I think, irrefutable proof uh, that Mr Hayden cannot continue in his role uh, given his acceptance 
of an invitation to a fundraising event does for the your, government. Does your criticism of his judgment on this uh, stem from the fact that it was a fundraiser or just that it was a Liberal Party event? Because the point's being made, I think, by the government, that, or indeed by George Brandis a little earlier, that at $80 a head in New South Wales or in Sydney, by the time you hire a venue, throw in drinks and the meal, it's unlikely to have been a fundraising event. Does that matter in your critique or is it the fact that it was associated with the Liberal Party? Well, if the Liberal Party discloses all of the money they've received, they can also include in that what expenses they may have incurred at this forthcoming event. So we'll know what the net profit was to the Liberal Party. The reality is that the government must act now to have this person disqualify himself from that role. We've said all along the Commission as a, a witch hunt into the political opponents of the government and today we've seen uh, by the actions of the Commissioner uh, that this Commission is entirely tainted, entirely tainted. Uh, and the government now, it's the Prime Minister, this is the test again for the Prime Minister to act and have this person removed from that position. I will ask you a process question about removal in a moment, but just finally on the, the function itself. When does Labor believe or suspect, how long ago did Justice Hayden sign up as a guest speaker at this Well, I, I've been advised that this has been known now for some months, some months. So the only reason why Mr Hayden has chosen today to withdraw from this event is because it's been publicly disclosed uh, Although I think through his officials at the Commission, they say that, that he'd re arrived at his position to pull out before the first media inquiry this morning. Well, I think it's clear now that there's, it's, it's not coincidental that the matter was uh, becoming uh, publicly known. Uh, he's chosen to withdraw from this Liberal Party event. He now has to withdraw from another Liberal Party event called the Trade Union Royal Commission. All right. Just on process, how can a royal commissioner be removed? You're asking the Prime Minister to, to sack him, but have you looked into the legalities? They're a pretty special beast legally, a royal commission. Look, it would be uh, very, un obviously, it'd be a, an exceptional matter to come before the Parliament to consider uh, the termination of someone in this office. And of course, there's some precedent in relation to judges. Um, uh, both uh, in so far as how, for example, the Parliament dealt with the former High Court Justice, uh, which didn't f didn't wasn't completed, uh, but also there's been in other jurisdictions uh, Parliaments dealing with these matters. But that's really uh, something uh, for another day. Uh, our position today is that Mr. Hayden, by his own actions, ha has really met, has really ensured that he cannot continue, and the Prime Minister uh, must. Uh, terminate his office, this captain's pick uh, is a bad, uh, a bad call by the Prime Minister and he has to fix it. OK, we'll hear more from you, I'm presuming, when question time resumes, but you're just signalling there that there's no imminent move in this Parliament to try on some removal well, motion we, or whatever's required? We, as you know, uh, Greg, we sought uh, to move a motion uh, to call on the government to disqualify uh, Mr Hayden. Now, that was shut down by the government. We now have an opportunity uh, of course, to uh, in question time to examine this matter more fully, uh, and it's really, uh, but the you know it really is now at the feet of the prime minister. He has to take action uh, against Mr. Hayden in relation to this matter um, because the entire commission has been tainted by these revelations today. All right, Brendan O'Connor, we'll let you go there and to prepare for the next instalment during Thank question time. Thanks very much. Australians woke to calls by a Liberal backbencher for the Defence Force to expand military operations from Iraq into Syria. Dan Tian's view was his own, but it was quickly backed in by the Prime Minister. Tony Abbott has confirmed discussions are being held with coalition partners on a move into Syria. The Prime Minister has previously said that Syria is legally different to conduct military operations in because there's no government that Australia recognises there. So here's what all the majors, major players are saying today, beginning with Mr Abbott's views on Syria from September last year.
the legalities of operations in Syria are quite different from the legalities of operations in Iraq. If we're acting in Iraq, we should also be acting in Syria. Syria is essentially ungoverned space uh, with a regime that we don't recognise. My understanding is that we could formally notify um, the United Nations that we are going to, to join that campaign, uh, but I think, it, you know, in short, we can work through that. That is possible. There are ways for us to do that. I think it's extraordinary, frankly, that the government sent out a, a backbencher to start floating ideas without any clear proposal, without any, any explanation to the Australian people of what the legal basis would be, what the mission would be. It is time for us to act. It is time for us to act. We've got the UN Secretary General saying it's time for the world to act, and I believe it's time we stepped up. No formal request has been made and no formal decision has been taken. While the legality is different, uh, whether these airstrikes are taking place in Syria or Iraq, um, the morality is the same. Uh, the death cult is just as evil uh, on either side of the border. It's just as dangerous on either side of the border. It's just as deadly on either side of the border. Um, and uh, that's why I can understand uh, why there is some interest on the part of our partners in Australian airstrikes well, being extended. Well, I value our national security too much to give uh, off the top of the head sort of uh, thought bubbles. Without a clear legal basis um, for Australian involvement, uh, and without a clear plan, like what does victory in Syria look like, I think it would be very dangerous to send Australian personnel into one of the most dangerous places on earth right now. When it comes to any extension or change to the initial propositions upon which Labor has given support to the government, what we will do is we will sit down and talk to the government. Uh, and again, as I understand, no formal request has come from the United States. It's a hideous civil war. And I hope that the Abbott government thinks twice before committing the ADF to an open-ended conflict there. Obviously there have been some approaches made at various levels, um, but no formal request has come, uh, no formal decision has been taken, so I stress we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves here. Uh, but nevertheless, whatever the legalities, the moralities uh, are the same on either side of the border. Well, the Prime Minister talking there about the moralities and the legalities of operating as we do currently the Australian Defence Force in Iraq and then extending that across the border into Syria. Well, Peter Jennings from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute has been looking at these possibilities for quite some time and we spoke to him just a little earlier. Peter Jennings, before we get to some of the legalities and the strategic considerations with an expansion, does it strike you, it has struck some, as odd that the advocacy for an expansion into Syria has been led by the head of the Intelligence Committee or, in effect, by a backbencher? Is that precedented in your years observing uh, defence matters? Well, I'm delighted when any politician talks strategy, uh, Greg. I think that's a good thing and there ought to be more of it in Parliament. Uh, Dan Tien's obviously an independent thinking sort of person. He's played a pretty good role on that intelligence committee, so I'm not surprised that it comes from him. Uh, and I think it reflects a discussion that we need to have about this military campaign. Why? What would justify the need for an expansion, by Australia at least, uh, into operations over or in Syria? Well, we need a plan to win, uh, and we're not going to be in a situation to defeat the Islamic State if we don't take the fight in a believable and credible way into Syria. And my view is, you know, if, we, if we're going to be uh, undertaking military operations in the Middle East at all, we need to have a credible plan to, develop, uh, to deliver some sort of victory out of those operations. Otherwise, why are we there? Well, what about an Australian air roll over Syria makes that victory more achievable? Well, uh, I think one of the things we have to do is to come up with a, a believable plan for defeating the Islamic State in Syria. At the moment, all we have is a sort of a, a promise of some training which the Americans are undertaking that may lead to the ability to do operations in a, in a few years' time. If we leave it that long, the Islamic State will be consolidated and the caliphate will still be there. 
So I think um, additional air operations may be worth considering if the purpose of those operations is to go after the, the leadership of the Islamic State in order to do lasting damage to them. If Australia is looking at this and apparently talking to the US about it, would we take it as read that the US would be altering and stepping up considerably uh, its efforts in Syria? Well, I think this is one of the risks that we have to think here about, is that the, the, there appears to be no appetite in the Obama administration to do more in the Middle East. In fact, I think President Obama's objective is to, is to have the absolute minimal US activity. I, I wouldn't want us to be doing this alone. So in essence, what we need is a discussion around the serious coalition countries, of which Australia is, is a leading player, in order to see if collectively there's something we're prepared to do more. And what could we credibly do with the assets that we have that you think could make a difference? I think what we need to do is look very carefully at the um, IS leadership structure, particularly in Raqqa, which is the, the main town that they've occupied in Syria, to see if it's not possible through uh, more effective targeting to actually go after the leaders of the organisation. So much of the air campaign at the moment, Greg, has been killing foot soldiers, destroying vehicles one at a time. That may be helping to bottle IS up, but it's not actually delivering any believable path to a victory. Now, leaving the training aside, the use of air power so far has been to uh, disrupt and immobilise the, uh, the enemy, uh, but... It, all the groundwork was left to uh, Kurds and militias of, of different descriptions. Do you think there's any likelihood of a plan that would see uh, the coalition in on-the-ground combat roles in either country, Iraq or Syria? Well, again, the big issue is the reluctance of the Americans to undertake those roles. Um, but the, the, the military pressure, the logic of military operations is such that if you're training the Iraqi forces, for example, you will get a better result if you go forward into the field with them to really continue that process of instructing them in how to conduct military operations. I think it's possible that there might be some move towards allowing the trainers to do this because ultimately the military advice to all of the governments that are participating must surely be to say, look, if you want to deliver success, you're going to have to let us go further forward in order to carry the fight to the Islamic State. But on the curve of risk, it goes up very sharply, doesn't it, when you make that sort of decision? It does, but don't underestimate the risks that we're already facing by being uh, deploying trainers into Iraq right now. The, the uh, risk of uh, so-called green on blue attacks in the army bases is high, as is the risk of uh, improvised explosive devices. And, uh, you know, one shouldn't minimise the fact that our forces are already in harm's way. OK, Australia doesn't recognise uh, the government in Syria. What are the legal obstacles, do you think, or is it a pretty simple mechanism that says we do operations over or in that country? Well, I think that the, the two things that are unlikely to happen is, firstly, President Assad is not going to give agreement for operations, and secondly, if we went to the UN Security Council, the Russians would veto it. So really worrying about those international legal obligations, I think, is rather fatuous. The issues we have to determine, I think, is if we can carry out operations that are legitimate in terms of uh, protecting uh, or minimising the risk to civilians. And I think we need to see if the international community, minus the Russians, uh, is prepared to actually back uh, an expansion of coalition operations. Without a, a UN resolution of any sort? We won't get a UN resolution because the Russians have made it clear up until now that they'll veto anything which um, puts at risk their relationship with President Assad of uh, Syria. But in the meantime, we have you know hundreds of thousands of Syrians killed, millions of people displaced and turned into refugees. I think it's wrong to be focusing on whether we can get a resolution out of the Security Council when there is such a humanitarian crisis at play. All right, Peter Jennings, thank you. Thank you. Well, Islamic State is making its presence felt closer to home. It's hacked details, including mobile phone numbers, passwords and private emails of 1,400 people, and it's published them. The group calling itself Islamic State Hacking Division managed to capture material on at least eight Australians in that list, understood to include, we believe, a Victorian MP, public servants and defence employees. Now, we spoke to the Justice Minister, Michael Keenan, a little earlier. He assures everyone that authorities are right onto that breach. 
Well, Michael Keenan, let's start with the basics. What does the government know about this group calling itself Islamic State Hacking Division and their activities here? Uh, well, we know that Daesh in the Middle East uh, do have a very online and active... Uh, well, they have a very active online presence. Uh, we know they have a very active uh, social media presence and they are effective at using that um, to further their gruesome aims. Um, so we are urging all Australians to be aware that there is risks in operating on the online environment. Uh, the government is aware of them and we're doing everything we can to stop those risks. But just in the same way as people need to be aware of their physical security uh, in the heightened terror threat environment, um, they also need to be aware of their cyber security. Uh, and I would urge Australians to take necessary precautions and we're keen to explain to the Australian people what they are. OK, well, let's talk specifically about today's reports that uh, 1,400 people uh, records from 1,400 people, including uh, ADF employees, a Victorian MP and fi uh, public servants. Can you confirm that some of their details are published on the list? Well, look, I can confirm that uh, up to 1,500 people's details have been compromised um, and then at least eight Australians, but I'm not going to go into any further details beyond that. What do you understand to be the source? How easily were these records obtained? Uh, well, look, again, I don't think it's helpful for me to go into the ins and outs ins and outs of those operational matters. Um, but our authorities are very good about deterring these online threats. Um, we've got the best law enforcement community, the best intelligence community in the world. Uh, the government has resourced that community and given them the powers that they need to keep people safe. And all Australians should be reassured that they are up to the task of protecting them. Uh, although I'd also urge all Australians to take basic measures in the online environment to keep themselves safe as well. Now, you've identified that at least eight Australians are on the list that's been published. Could there be more? Uh, look, we're not aware of any more. And what sort of protection, if any, has been put around or could be put around the eight Australians identified? Uh, well, if there was any threat to any Australian's physical security, then obviously we would take the appropriate action to make sure that people are safe. Uh, we are very good at doing that. Uh, if there's a threat to Australia, we will stop it from occurring. Um, we've done that six times within the past year. We've stopped terrorist attacks from occurring in Australia. Um, so we are very aware about what goes on here. Uh, our agencies are good at what they do. Um, they are providing appropriate protection for all Australians. Uh, and uh, I hope that the Australian people can reassure that the government uh, is doing all that we can to make sure that the threat that is emanating uh, from this so-called Islamic State in the Middle East is one that we take seriously and one that we're doing everything we can to protect Australians from. Would it be prudent to assume that the eight Australians identified uh, could potentially be at risk of physical harm? Look, I'm not going to go into anything further about those particular Ada, just to confirm uh, that story has run uh, and that is correct. Uh, we're obviously doing everything we can to make sure that everyone in Australia is safe uh, and Australians should be reassured by that. Now, while the weakening Chinese currency is causing havoc in international markets right now, the head of China's most powerful economic body is here in Canberra for high-level talks. Xu Xiaoxi is the chairman of China's National Development and Reform Commission and is responsible for developing China's next five-year economic plan. He's met the Treasurer and the Trade Minister to talk about the state of the Chinese economy and trade and investment between the two nations. The visit has also coincided with another move to strengthen ties between the two countries. Joe Hockey has introduced the legislation into Parliament, paving the way for Australia's involvement in the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Unquestionably, Mr Speaker, Asia faces a major infrastructure financing gap. It's estimated the gap alone is estimated to be worth $8 trillion over the next decade. That's the funding shortfall for infrastructure that is growing to grow the Asian economy. In a significant step to address this challenge, Australia uh, is becoming a founding member of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and this will help to fund major new infrastructure throughout the region. <coughs> And that is a very high-level delegation the Chinese have brought here, complete with a large travelling Chinese media pack. And they've been in Canberra for a couple of days now. The briefing the Treasurer received was a very long one. That meeting went for it was scheduled to go for about four hours as the Trade Minister and Joe Hockey got involved. Now, same-sex marriage has been a hot topic this week after the Coalition reached a policy 
position, one which steps from a locked-in vote on traditional marriage uh, through to potential options in the future, including a free vote, uh, a, a, a plebiscite and a referendum. Well, the Senate's crossbenchers are coming together to make some sort of statement on same-sex marriage. Let's hear from them now. Equality. And I think it's fair to say that all of us come to this issue from different perspectives. Uh, the Greens have obviously been uh, long and proud supporters of uh, ending discrimination in marriage. Um, other people will have different views on this issue. But one thing I think we all agree on is that uh, we need to deal with this issue and deal with it quickly. It is our view, it's a view of the Greens, that this is best dealt with through legislation. It's best dealt with by ensuring that every parliamentarian in this place is allowed to vote according to their conscience. The Liberal Party have decided that they will go against their own tradition, which is allowing people to do that. The Party of Individual Liberty and Freedom has decided that they're going to clamp down and ensure that uh, Tony Abbott's view reigns supreme. Tony Abbott himself has said that he thinks that the way to deal with this is by allowing the people to decide. Well, we do not trust Tony Abbott to deal with this issue. The man is a law unto himself, and we simply do not trust him to be able to handle an issue like this in a way that is fair and even-handed. And that's why we have gathered together collectively to say very, very clearly that if this is not dealt with through a free vote of the parliament, as it should be, then if there is to be a plebiscite, it must be, it must be at this election. And it must be the parliament that owns the plebiscite and drafts the question because we cannot trust Tony Abbott to handle this. He has been tricky in the way he's dealt with the issue. He's used branch stacking, to use one of his own minister's words, to ensure he gets the outcome he wants. And we have no doubt that he will be tricky and deceitful when it comes to drafting the question and ensuring that this has uh, as little chance of success as possible in becoming law. And that's why collecti collectively we are saying to the parliament that if this is to be dealt with through the parliament, then we must own the question collectively as a parliament and we must ensure, we must ensure that it is dealt with at the coming election and not dragged out uh, to the never never. So I'll allow some of my colleagues to say a few words uh, and then we'll take some questions. Thanks everybody. Oh, well, Janet, why don't you say a couple of words just quickly about the bill, just um, that what the bill does, and then, yes. we, then we'll... So the, so the bill sets out some criteria that says that if a plebiscite is to occur, that it must be held at the next election, that the question is to be included in the bill, that the voting should be compulsory, and that there should be funding for both a yes and a no case. Critically, this is, would be... If we can't... If the Parliament can't make a decision because the Coalition have not allowed their members a free vote. The Parliament has, has been blocked in its decision-making process at the moment. So given those circumstances, having a plebiscite at the next election would be the fastest and best way to achieve marriage equality in Australia. Yeah, look, thank you. Um, I guess uh, the disappointing thing is that uh, our Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, had a great opportunity to have this very, very important issue sorted by allowing uh, everyone to have, have a conscience vote. He's obviously uh, uh, decided that that's not going to be the case. This is a, a really important issue that a lot of Australians uh, want to see resolved one way or the other. And I think through a, a plebiscite would be the, be the way to do it. The other thing is that uh, the NRL, the National Rugby League, uh, as a side note, uh, was the first uh, uh, sporting organisation in this country to uh, support uh, marriage equality uh, and of course all the other sports uh, followed suit. But at the end of the day uh, we need to uh, sort this issue out and suit it, uh, sort it out as soon as possible because it affects a lot of people in this country and uh, a lot of people in this country want this result. Thank you. Yeah sure. Um, <clears throat> let's get on with this. Let's resolve this issue. Uh, the Prime Minister's tied himself up in knots on this issue. Just a few weeks ago, he was uh, dismissing the idea of a referendum after Ireland's successful referendum to, for marriage equality. He now says that's the path we need to go down. Uh, it is very confusing. If the Parliament, if all MPs and Senators can't have a, 
um, conscience vote, then there needs to be a conscious vote of all Australians uh, through a plebiscite. But for goodness sakes, let's get this uh, done. Uh, let's have a vote as soon as possible, rather than this being put off to the never-never as some um, from the Prime Minister down and some of his colleagues want. I think that you need to give the people the say if the Parliament uh, doesn't have the courage to deal with this issue decisively. Uh, the, um, the government lost a big opportunity to, uh, to be seen as uh, modern and progressive uh, this week. And so it's, it's actually quite sad that, uh, that this issue has come to, to today. The plan will be um, to introduce the private uh, senator's bill. It's a Greens bill. It will call for a plebiscite to, con to occur at the same time as the next election. Um, I endorse that because it will save $120 million for a special plebiscite. I also agree with uh, Senator Di Natale. Uh, the Prime Minister is not to be trusted on this issue. The, um, the question of what, what, uh, what question should go to the people in a plebiscite um, can't be left to him, so the bill will prescribe what that is. Um, it's sad that it's come to this. It could have been dealt with. Uh, we could have had a uh, conscience vote uh, decision or a free vote decision this week and then a decision by the parliament by uh, the time of the next election. It could have been off the agenda for the next election so nobody lost or gained votes over it. They, they didn't do that so uh, it's going to be a live issue now for time to come. But uh, uh, given where we're at, I think this bill is a reasonable way to go about it. Um, for those of you who've been watching me, I've actually been calling for this for quite some time, for a plebiscite to be taken to the next election. One, firstly, it will be cost effective. Secondly, the Australian people will not be satisfied um, until they have had their vote. OK, this is not up to Parliament, and I've been saying this all along, the people of Australia must have their vote. Only then will they truly accept the result from that vote. OK, and only then will the healing process um, begin. And that healing process will begin um, for both sides. It doesn't matter who wins or loses. Right now, the way in which this has been handled um, by the PM, the only thing that he has achieved out of this, as a PM, you are supposed to unite the nation. Right now, PM, you have divided the nation. You've done that with your own bare hands. And you can hang your head in shame for that today. Thank you. Marriage equality has been uh, one of the biggest social issues we've faced in quite some time. And I think uh, when a vote comes to marriage equality, it will be one of the biggest social issues votes that have probably ever gone through this parliament. Um, it's constantly been foiled by political to and fro. Um, and I think as time, that stopped. Uh, I've, recent, I've, I've spoken in my first speech and I stand by representative democracy. When you have a six hour meeting to decide that you won't let your members vote on their conscience, that's not very representative to me. So I completely support this bill to bring this uh, decision to a plebiscite so the people of Australia really can have their voice heard. And once that has happened, I would expect that um, the government of the day will uh, follow the voice of the people of Australia. Um, I think it's quite exciting to see uh, the Senate come together like this. Um, we've seen the Prime Minister try and foil uh, a free vote uh, across this uh, House and, uh, and the, the Senate to stop his members from having the right to represent their electorates. This is a circuit breaker. The opportunity to uh, allow the Senate to set the terms of reference for a, for a plebiscite at this election. Um, some will say, uh, this is what Tony Abbott wants, we'll bring it on. Bring it on, because we know that the Australian people desperately want to get the politics out of this. This shouldn't be about politics. This should be about love. And here, the crossbenchers, I'm um, extremely, extremely happy today that despite the division and the negativity from the Prime Minister, the Senate has been able to step up uh, to the challenge and to take on the fight.